In this video, I want to ask a couple questions to all creationists who may be watching over the existence of transitional species in the hominin fossil record. Before that, though, I need to clarify a few things. First off is the way humans are classified in relation to other apes. Now, we obviously are apes as indicated by more our morphology, but for the purposes of this video, I will refer to our species as modern humans, extant non-human hominids as apes, and all extinct hominids as hominines. The reason for this become clear in a moment. Second, human evolution is not an orthogenic line of progress. Since the mid-20th century, the hominin fossil record has become replete with fossil individuals from numerous species indicating a branching tree of biodiversity. It's not a straight line from ape to human. Finally, the term hominid refers to great apes as a whole. Hominin refers exclusively to bipedal great apes like ourselves. The use of the term hominid to refer to extinct humans and Australopith species is simply a holdover from the old method of classification. Moving on, we'll now look at the specific set of morphological traits that make our species unique among other great apes. This includes having a relatively large brain, possession of a mental eminence, having small teeth, various cranial and postcranial modifications for obligate bipedalism, and others. These traits will become important when we examine hominin fossils to determine whether or not they are transitional between apes and humans. Now, indications of increased intelligence in hominin species are difficult to infer since primatologists now know that even comparatively less intelligent apes regularly make tools in the wild today. So the benchmark by which we will measure increased intelligence will be the encephalization ratio or measure of brain size relative to the body in addition to average cranial capacity, the use of stone tools as well as other technology like fire. Now to test if creationism is true, when examining fossils, all of the particular traits that distinguish different kinds should be found fully formed without any gradation between seemingly related different kinds. Now if evolution is true, there should be at least a few extinct species possessing a mix of characters illustrating the evolution of derived traits specific to modern humans. The first species we're going to focus on is Artipithecus ramidus, first described in the early 90s from fossil fragments more recent discoveries, including the recovery of a partial skeleton, reveal that this animal displays the initial adaptations for a bipedal lifestyle, including an abducted knee, derived traits in the pelvis, such as a lesser ischial notch, and broad hips. The species was, however, primarily arboreal and very primitive, as indicated by possession of other traits, including heavily curved phalanges, a divergent hallux, and possessed other primitive traits like a chimpanzee-sized brain. The species thought to link A. ramidus and the Australopithecus Australopithecus anamensis, which may also turn out to be the direct ancestor of other species like Australopithecus barrel gazelle. The next hominin we're going to focus on is the as of yet unnamed Australopithecus species currently being uncovered by the team led by Philip Tobias in Serquentine, in South Africa. While the strata this individual has been found in is notoriously difficult to accurately radiometrically date, it does have the type of foot morphology being halfway between the Archipithecines and more derived Australopith and human species. The next hominin we're going to focus on is the most iconic, Australopithecus afarensis. While this species is most well known from the partial skeleton Lucy, this species is represented by dozens of individuals of both genders a variety of ages, including small children. Their fossils indicate that this species still exhibits a high degree of sexual dimorphism, possesses a relatively small brain, large canines in the male, and a relatively thick dental enamel. However, afarensis also displays the first development of a parabolic dental arcade, anterior migration of the foramen magnum, and other derived cranial dental characters, as well as a whole suite of postcranial characters putting it halfway between humans and more primitive hominines. This species is also likely to be responsible for the almost human footprints in Lake Tole, Tanzania, and a candidate for being the first hominine to manufacture stone tools. Given these traits, the consensus among paleoanthropologists is that A. afarensis is likely the direct ancestor of all later hominines. Included in these descendants are what used to be referred to as robust Australopithecines but are now given their own genus, Pyranthropus. These animals are known primarily from their skulls and possess an exaggerated sagittal crests, enlarged nuchal tori, broad faces, large molars, and other traits which would make them look similar to a sort of bipedal savanna gorilla. Moving over to the gracile side of the family tree, the less robust afarensis descendants include the recently described Australopithecus sediba, which is another contender for the ancestor of our genus. This species is fairly primitive cranially, but does show several derived features in the hips and hands, which in some ways are more derived than Homo habilis. Another gracile, much more well-known Australopithecus, Australopithecus africanus. Initially known from the skull of a child, some 20th century anthropologists argued that Tong may have been a juvenile chimpanzee, but the traits of the skull and the remains of hundreds of other individuals closely alight with other hominines. These include an abbreviated sacrum, possession of lumbar lordosis, continued anterior migration of the foramen magnum, the development of increasingly human-like teeth, dental parabolism, reduced canines, and expanded cranial capacity. A contemporary Eastern African species is Australopithecus gari. 
Agar is another contender to be the first hominin to manufacture stone tools and given its morphology as well as its chronological and more importantly its geographic placement, make it a prime contender to replace A. Africanus as the ancestor of the first humans. We're now going to look at the first generation of men, collectively referred to as early Homo. These were represented by likely two or possibly three species, including the recently described Homo gaunteigensis. The other one or two taxa are referred to henceforth as the Habilines display an increase in cranial capacity overlapping on the low end with derived Australopiths and at the high end with derived humans. These animals possess precision grip and are also constantly associated with the first version of stone tools called the Old One industry. Tool use and possession of spoken language in the Habilines is evidence from endocasts, which display an increase in the size of the Broca's area and other cephalic regions. While the Habilines fit the exact criteria of an early human species according to one definition, some experts argue that they are just primitive enough, excluding the root offensive sample, to be reclassified as an advanced species of Australopith. The first hominin remains to be found outside of Africa are found in Demonisi, Georgia. Formally classified as an early example of Homo erectus, they have been given their own species, H. georgicus. These humans possess a brain size almost the exact same size as the Habilines and are found with their type of technology. However, they do display what is arguably the first hard evidence of empathy in the hominid fossil record, and their postcrania completely blurs any imagined line between the Habilines and Homo erectus. Homo erectus is the first known species to successfully colonize and dominate the ecology of Africa and Asia. These animals display the widest variation in cranial size of any human species and display a great deal of variation in other parts of their morphology as well. In fact, the fossil cache for Homo erectus could be considered to be a single species with at least half a dozen locally adapted breeds or two or even three separate species. They display yet another advance in intelligence as inferred from the development of larger brains and more advanced technology known as the Acheulean industry. These hominins are also associated with the first evidence of controlled fire use and may have even built simple wooden rafts, but still lack many of the definitive characters of modern humans. For example, the most complete individual of this species and one of the most complete fossil primates ever recovered is known as the Turkana boy. This individual bears obvious cranial similarities with more primitive hominin species, but his postcranial morphology in many respects is fairly modern, with some important exceptions. One of these features is the possession of extremely narrow hips indicating superior long-distance running than modern humans, but is contrasted with the females of this species, which are more dimorphic than modern forms. It should also be noted that Homo erectus also marks a halfway point between the level of spoken language seen in Habilines and with modern humans, as inferred from the size of the holes in the thoracic vertebra. A possible but now unlikely descendant of Homo erectus is the recently described island hobbits of Indonesia called Homo floresiensis. While some initially interpreted these hominins as being modern humans, which were all microcephalic or suffered from Laron syndrome, these humans possess traits not consistent with those pathologies and instead display characters not found in our species, but older humans like the erectus and happily people, as well as their own traits unique to them. Returning west, let's look at another hominin species referred to here as Homo heidelbergensis. These hominins were the first species accepted to invade Europe, and they also display some of the first examples of ritual defleshing, mass burials, and other traits suggesting they live in large complex bands. Due to the geographic and morphological variation of these hominins, it makes them problematic to classify since some paleoanthropologists argue they could be multiple species or very primitive or derived members of already existing hominin species. Regardless of their classification, the Heidelberg people are universally accepted as the ancestral hominin for two morphologically distinct human models, a northern cold-adapted robust form and a southern heat-adapted gressel form. The first, the Neanderthals, display the largest overall cranial size of any hominin species, retain re robust bones and heavy musculature, however they are on average shorter than modern humans and possess a much lower EQ. Being the oldest non-modern hominin species, the sample size for Neanderthals is roughly in the excess of 500 individuals. Their remains include the skeletons of adults, sub-adults, and even infants. This allows experts to track their ontological development, and these studies have shown that Neanderthals had a very similar development to modern humans with a few important differences. The southern form, modern Homo sapiens, appear in Africa about 200,000 years ago and over the course of several thousand years expanded their territories into Asia Minor and the rest of the world several times, most notably after the Toba catastrophe about 70,000 years ago. These modern humans are associated with everything which makes our species distinct, including highly abstract and symbolic thinking, art, and of course, religion. Now, for all the creationists watching, especially those of the biblical variety who believe that Yahweh created Adam and Eve from magic dirt and a spare rib, and especially those who deny their taxonomic classification as apes, can you propose a reasoned explanation as to why any of these paleo species presented in this video don't qualify as transitional, closing the supposedly unbridgeable gap between modern humans and other great apes as evolution predicts? 
And second, do you have an explanation for why professional creations themselves can't decide which of these hominins are part of the divinely created and completely separate ape and human kinds? I think your responses will be enlightening.